Uh, well, welcome to session four of Engaging with Islam. And today we're going to be looking at using the Quran in evangelism. Using the Quran in evangelism. Now, I'm not actually encouraging you and wanting you to use the Quran in evangelism. Uh, because I just want us to stick with the Bible uh, as Christians. I think that's what we want to do. But sometimes you may need to refer to the Quran. Sometimes you may need to. For instance, you may be on a university campus or out in a market or somewhere and a Muslim gives you a Quran and says, read it. And so will you read it with them as an opportunity for, for sharing with them? Uh, it, it may be that you give somebody a Bible and they say, well, why don't you read the Quran? And so if that situation comes up, are you just going to say, uh, no, I'm not going to, to read the Quran. I want you to read the Bible. Of course, you're going to say, no, we, you know, OK, we'll, we'll read both books. And so sometimes that situation may come up. It may be in your situation that Muslims may be very hostile to, to you reading the Quran. I don't know, but I'm talking about a situation where uh, you have a relationship where you can read both books for whatever reason. And so what I want to do today is to give some suggestions as to how we can incorporate the Quran into our evangelism. Now the first point I want to raise is, should a Christian even do this? Should they even refer to the Quran at all? And I believe that we can because of the Apostle Paul's example to us. In the book of Acts, verse 17, sorry, chapter 17, verse 28, we read the Apostle Paul quoting Greek philosophy as part of his evangelism. And so we read here, For in him we live and move and have our being, as even some of your own poets have said. For we are indeed his offspring. And he's, he's quoting famous Greek philosophers and poets, and he's using that as a way of introducing Christianity to these people by picking up on some common ideas. So I think that we can use the Quran, but there are some things we need to consider. The first thing I want us to consider is will you, reading the Quran and using the Quran, cause a young Christian to stumble in their faith. So you want to be careful before you start using the Quran because you don't want a young Christian to look at you and say, oh, my leader is reading the Quran. He must think it's a holy book. He must think Islam's a true religion. So you see how you could cause somebody to stumble if you're not careful. It's the same with inviting someone to go to a mosque, taking Christians to the mosque. You just want to be careful before you do that. I'm not saying don't do it. I'm saying you need to make sure you don't cause a young Christian to stumble. The second thing I want us to consider is that your manner in reading the Quran and making comments from it should be humble. You're not an expert on the Quran, so don't pretend to be an expert. But if a Muslim has invited you to read the Quran, they've given you a translation uh, and they've said, no, why don't you read this? Then, of course, you can read it and give them verses and say, well, this is what I've read, you know, and, and discuss it with them. I've given you some, uh, I've given you a URL to a, a fairly good translation of the Quran. It's called a clear Quran and it's in the footnotes there. Now, one thing I want to say is that Muslims are actually allowed to read the Bible according to the Quran. In some cultures, the Muslims are encouraged you know, not to even touch the Bible at all. But that's actually not what the Quran says. That's more Islamic tradition rather than what the Quran says. And so if you look here at, uh, at Surah 10 verse 94, it says, if you, and that's referring to Muhammad, if you are in doubt about what we have sent down, now when it says what we have sent down, that's a way of saying uh, God in the Quran. We is a reference to God there. And it's saying, if you are in doubt about what we have sent down to you, that is the Quran, ask those who recited the scripture before you. And so Muhammad was even able to 
ask Christians and Jews about their scriptures to confirm what the Quran was saying. So, he, so he's, he's allowed to refer to the, uh, to the Bible. Now, one of the reasons why this is also helpful is that the Quran retells many of the Bible accounts, many of the Bible stories. And so there is this common ground that is there that can be useful. Well, I say that by way of introduction. What I would like to do now is to give you three different ways that you can use the Quran in your evangelism. Now, the first way is by reading parallel passages in the Quran which more or less agree with each other. More or less agree. One of the things that can happen is that we can get into arguments with Muslims and we want to try to avoid that if we can. And if you look up verses where we disagree with each other, then you know, you'll be discussing that issue and where you go from there, I'm not exactly sure, right? You may make progress, you may not. But if you read a passage where it's saying the same thing, I believe we can show Muslims something more important. We can show them something more important than just where we disagree. And so I'm going to give you two examples of where we can look at a, a parallel story in the Quran and in the Bible, but how we can use that to show something much more important. So the first one is the story of Jonah in the Quran. Let me read it out to you. And truly Jonah was among the message bearers. Behold, he fled to the laden ship and then cast lots and was among those rejected. Then the fish swallowed him, for he was blameworthy. And had he not been among those who glorify, he would have tarried in its belly till the day they are resurrected. So we cast him sick upon the barren shore, and we caused a gird tree to grow over him. Then we sent him to a hundred thousand or more, and they believed. So we granted them enjoyment for a while. Now, you can see that story, and it, it's sort of a, a bit of a summary of the Bible, isn't it? And so you could read that with your Muslim friend, and then you could read the whole of the book of Jonah in the Bible. And this is what I'm suggesting you do. You read the, the story in the Quran, then you read in the Bible. Now, Jonah is quite a short book in the Bible. It's only about two pages, two and a half. So you can read it in 10 or 15 minutes, doesn't take very long. And then you can make some observations. Now, the first observation I want to make for you is that I think the only reason you understood that story was because you knew what the Bible story was. Just think about it. Look at this. Behold, Jonah fl fled to a full laden ship. Why did he flee? It doesn't tell you. You need to know that God sent him to the Assyrians who were the enemies of the Israelites. And so Jonah didn't want to go there and bring them forgiveness to the, to the, the Ninevites. So you don't know who he's being sent to, so you don't know why he's actually fleeing. Or why are they casting lots? Right? They're casting lots because of the storm. So the only reason you understand this is because you know the Bible. If you didn't have the Bible, there are details in here which just don't make sense and have no explanation. And you see, if you read the Quran and then you read the Bible and you ask your Muslim friend, you know, what do you notice? I think there are four points that we can bring out which are fairly obvious. The first is that the Bible has the original book of the prophet. It's got the original book. You'll just notice that. You read the two and you'll see that the Bible's got the original one. You'll also see that the Bible has the complete story. The Bible has the complete story. And again, you're going to just see that in the comparison, aren't you? The Bible has the original book of the prophet. It has the complete message of the prophet. Now, we can acknowledge that the Quran does have some details. I'm not saying it's got none. Yeah, it's got some details there. I can acknowledge that. But if you really want to understand what the Quran is referring to, then you should read the Bible. 
If you want to understand the, the full message of this prophet, you need to read the Bible because the Quran is just referring to it and sort of referring to it as an illustration, almost assuming that you already know the story. So they're the four points I'd be bringing out. The Bible has the original book of the prophet, the complete message of the prophet. The Quran does have some details, but if you really want to understand the Quran or the prophet, you need to read the Bible first. Now, another example is that of the miracles of Jesus in the Quran. So in Surah chapter 3, verse 48 to 49, we read these words. And he, that is Allah, will teach Jesus the scripture and the wisdom and the Torah and the gospel. He will be a messenger to the children of Israel, saying, I have come to you with a sign from your Lord. I make for you out of clay the figure of a bird. Then I breathe into it and it becomes a bird by Allah's leave. And I heal the blind and the lepers and I revive the dead. Now there we have a, a very short summary of Jesus' life, don't we? Now you could read those two verses with Muslims, with your Muslim friend, and then you could read with them almost any part of the gospel you wanted to. I'm suggesting Matthew chapter 8 and 9, but you know you could read the Sermon on the Mount, you know, where it talks about Jesus bringing teaching and say, well, let's go and read Jesus' teaching because you won't get any of Jesus' teaching in the Quran. It talks about him being a teacher, but what, what was this teaching? Let them read the Sermon of the Mount. It talks about him healing the blind and lepers and raising the dead. Go and show them that in the Gospels. Let them read the whole story. It's actually really impressive. It's impressive for them because they hear that Jesus did these things, but the Quran doesn't give them any details. And again, this is not a... Uh, the, you know, the, this is where we're looking at, at parallel passages where, where we agree. But I hope you can see we can show them something more important. And that is that the Bible's got the original message, the complete message. The Quran does have some details. But if you really want to know what the Quran's referring to, you need to read the Bible. So that's my first way of using the Quran to look at parallel passages and to make the points that I've been showing you. And so you sit down with your Muslim friend if they're willing to read the Bible and the Quran together and you, you show them those things. Like I've said, and I've given you a list of some other ones that you can look at when it comes to the doctrine of creation and to Job. And you, you can look at those and you'll get the same type of points. Now, the second way I'm suggesting you can use the Quran in evangelism is by comparing and contrasting the Bible and the Quran at certain, uh, in certain topics. Here are some that you could bring up with Muhammad and Jesus. And again, these are not really contradictory ones or anything, they're just, they're just different, but they're interesting. So often when I speak with Muslims, they'll say to me that all the prophets are sinless. And you may have heard that type of thing, all the prophets are sinless. That's actually not what the Quran teaches. And we need to understand that a lot of what Muslims believe is not based on the Quran, but on their traditions and in, in, in their culture. While they may say that the prophets are sinless, when you read the Quran, you read verses like this. Look at Surah 47, verse 19. So know, O Muhammad, there is no God except Allah, and ask forgiveness for your sin and for believing men uh, and for, for your sin and for believing men and believing women. So Muhammad's actually commanded in the Quran to confess his sin. Now, I'm not trying to say he's the worst man in the world, but I'm saying to say he's sinless is just not what the Quran is saying. And then, of course, you can com compare that to verses in the Bible where it's speaking of Jesus. It says he committed no sin and no deceit was found in his mouth. And you can just point that out and say, you know, we should at least be honest to our books, right? J just be honest. I'm, we shouldn't exaggerate. And that's what we see here. I'm going to be looking at this next verse more in, I think, two days' time. But this is a very interesting verse in Surah 46, verse 9. It's Muhammad being commanded to say something, and this is what he says. Say, 
I am not something new among the messengers, and I do not know what will be done with me or with you. I only follow what is revealed to me. I am only a warner. So here we have Muhammad saying he doesn't know what Allah will do with him. And we're going to see this later on when we come to the topic of salvation. Uh, there's a lot more information on this. Now that's significant, isn't it? Because if a Muslim says, well, I know what's going to happen to me, and you, know, you can say, well, hang on, if Muhammad didn't know, then what is Islam really giving me? What does it really give you if Muhammad himself doesn't know? And then, of course, you, we can show this to Jesus, where Jesus answered, even if I testify on my own behalf, my testimony is valid, for I know where I came from and where I am going. So Jesus is very different there. Jesus knows exactly what's happening to him. Another contrast that you can do is not between Jesus and Muhammad, but you can look at the topic of paradise. And I've given you some references there. So Surah 56 verses 1 to 56, you could read that with a Muslim. And it looks like a lot of verses, but they're, they're quite short verses. So you can read them quite quickly. But it's the longest description I've, I've found of paradise in the Quran. And so you can read that description and compare it to Revelation chapters 21 and 22. And you just read the two descriptions of the new creation of, of paradise. And you'll see the types of differences that I've put down here. One will be, you know, that the Muslim men are promised virgin women. And so that's where it comes from. You, you can just say, okay, we don't have that in Christianity. That's not what our concept. But I think more importantly is that there's no presence of God in the Islamic paradise. I'm going to be looking at this in, uh, in one of the later sessions, but Islam has no temple theology. It has no temple theology. And so there's no temple language in paradise. In fact, there's no worship in Islamic paradise. It took me a long time to work this out. There's actually no worship. So in Islam, you worship now and you get the rewards later on. In Christianity, you get saved. So you, in Christianity, you don't worship God. You get saved so that you can worship God forever. And so just comparing these two pictures of paradise brings out a lot about worshipping God, a lot of big ideas. Another point, and this is not so much comparing the Bible and the Quran, but it, I'm just putting it in here. If you meet Iranian Muslims, Shia Muslims from Iran, then I think what you can do is you can actually show them the very positive place that Persia or Iran has in the Bible. Because out of all the nations, the Persian Empire the, uh, and the, the Iranian kings um, get a very good place. So in the book of Esther, uh, the, the kings have a good place. The Persian kings have a, a good place. In the book of Isaiah, Cyrus is presented as a messianic figure. And in the book of Daniel, you've got Xerxes, who is trying to help Daniel. And in Acts chapter 2, you've got uh, Jews and people from Persia coming to Jerusalem on the day of Pentecost and becoming Christians. And so Persia's actually got a very positive view in it. And so I just bring that up there because um, the, very often the Persian history doesn't get as much positive view in Islam. And so you can actually show that it gets a very positive view in the Bible. That's if you meet Iranian uh, Muslims. So that's my, my second way of using the Quran in evangelism, to compare it in different ways between Jesus and Muhammad, paradise, and, and, the, the, and for Persian people, uh, the place of Persia in the Bible. The last way I'd like to talk about using the Quran is to show you some useful verses from the Quran. These are some other useful verses. I know many of these you may say are already useful. But here are some other useful verses. And I particularly want to look at how the Quran validates the Bible. 
how the Quran says that the Bible is good. So let's look at these. Uh, o you who believe, that is you Muslims, believe in God and his messenger, that is Muhammad, and in the scripture which he sent down to his messenger, that is the Quran, and in the scripture which he sent down previously. That is, they're meant to believe the Bible. Let's look at the next reference. Do not dispute with the people of the scripture, that is, do not dispute with Christians and Jews, except with what is better. Instead say, we believe in what has been revealed to us and what has been revealed to you. So the Muslim response is, we, we believe in our book and we believe in your book. Have a look at this next reference. This is remarkable and there are three verses like this in the Quran and they're almost, well, they should be creedal statements. Say, we believe in God and what was revealed to us, that is the Quran, and in what was revealed to Abraham, Isaac, Ishmael, Jacob and the tribes and in what was given to Moses and Jesus and in what was given to the prophets from their Lord. We make no distinction between them. What a remarkable ending. Muslims are meant to make no distinction between any of the holy books. You can see how these can be useful verses if a Muslim saying the Quran says the Bible's been changed. I'll keep going. I've already looked at, at this one earlier. If you are in doubt about what we have sent down to you, that is, if you're in doubt about the Quran, what are you to do? Ask those who recited the scripture before you. Ask Christians and Jews, that means. Look at the next reference. We bestowed on him, that is Jesus, the gospel in which is a guidance and light, confirming that which had been revealed before in the Torah, a guidance and an admonition to those who fear God. Let the people of the gospel judge by what God has sent down in it. Now that's a remarkable verse, isn't it? It's saying that the revelation that came with Jesus, the gospel message that comes with Jesus, is what the Christians are to keep. Now that is assuming that the gospel that was given to Jesus is what Christians have, and that it's reliable and that they can consult it. It doesn't make sense if that's not the case. In fact, in the next reference I've got there, the context is Christians and Jews trying to convert Muslims to Christianity and Judaism. But they're trying, it's Christians trying to convert them to Christianity. And how is the Muslim to respond? And they say none will enter paradise except one who is a Jew or a Christian. That is merely their wishful thinking. Say, produce your proof if you should be truthful. So in other words, if you're saying to a Muslim, you should become a Christian, what's a Muslim meant to say? Bring your proof. That is from your scriptures. Bring your proof from your scriptures if, you're, if what you're saying is true. That's not a bad verse, is it? Like say, I've got proof. I'll give you some proof. I am the way, the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. I mean... We can give them our proof. Now, very often Muslims will claim that the Quran, in fact, teaches that the Bible has been corrupted. And there's a, a particular verse they go to, which is chapter 2, verse 79. Surah 2, verse 79. Let me read it to you. Woe to those who write the scripture with their own hands and then say, this is from God, so that they may sell it for a paltry price. Woe to them for what their hands have written. Woe to them for what they earn. And this is the one that Muslims bring up in their literature and in their debates. And they say, see, this verse is saying that it, the Bible's been corrupted. Now, first of all, it would be odd for this verse to be saying that because I've just showed you six verses where the Quran saying the Bible's trustworthy. But when we actually read this verse, it's not saying the Bible's been changed at all. Let's have a look at it. It says, woe to those who write the scripture with their own hands. Notice, it doesn't say woe to those who write false scripture. It's just saying woe to those who write scripture with their own hands. Now, all scripture was written by hand back then. So that can't be the problem, can it? You can't say this verse is saying, oh, they wrote it with their own hands. Because 
everything. You know, the Quran was written by hand. Every book was written by hand. So it's not identified as false scripture. The problem's not writing it with your own hand because it's got to be handwritten. And it, there's no problem in saying it's from God because handwritten scripture was from God. That's, that's how we got it. Here's the problem. So that they may sell it for a paltry price. That is, so they can make dishonest gain out of it. So the actual offence here that the Quran is speaking against is people selling scripture and making scripture just for profit and that that's not really the way of God. And we would agree with that. But the verse itself is not saying the Bible's been changed. But this is the most common one they come to and I just want to flag it for you. What does the Quran say about the Bible? Well, sorry, about scripture in general. It says, He who has sent down to you the scripture, set out distinctly. The word of your Lord is perfect in truth and justice. There is no one who can change his words. And so there's just this blanket statement that the word of God doesn't change. Now, I've given you a QR code there. And you can look that up. And I've had a debate on this subject where I give a much fuller description. Uh, I give a complete Bible, a Quran overview on this topic there. Now, the last point I want to bring up is using the Quran, using useful verses from the Quran. But this one requires a bit more theological education. You need a bit more theological education with this one, and I'll, I'll show you why. It's Jesus creating birds out of clay. So let's have a look at this first verse. Surah 38, verse 71 down to 75. It's talking about God creating Adam. It says, When your Lord said to the angels, I shall create mankind from clay. When I have formed him and breathed some of my spirit into him, I created him with my own hands. So here we have the creation account, which has come from the Bible, and it's about God making Adam from the dust of the earth with his own hands and breathing into him the breath of life. Okay, so there's that verse. Now, have a look at what we see with Jesus. I, Jesus, have come to you with a sign from your Lord. I will create for you out of clay the likeness of a bird. Then I will breathe into it and it will be a bird by the permission of God. So here we have Jesus creating life in precisely the same way that God does. Now, that's remarkable. That is remarkable. You'll notice that it does say that Jesus did it by the permission of God. But that does not stop this showing the divinity of Jesus because creating is what is unique to God. There are not many creators. There's only one creator. And if you give that unique attribute of God to someone, then you're giving them one of God's unique attributes. What defines God? See, what defines God? One of the things that define God is that he is the creator. Now, you can see that Muhammad has tried to change the story by saying Jesus only did it by Allah's permission. But what Jesus is doing is what is unique to God. So what have I got here? This story of Jesus creating birds comes from an early Christian fable about the childhood of Jesus. This original story demonstrated that Jesus was God by showing that he is the creator who gives life. What is surprising is that the Quran retells this story. In the Quran, the story now says that Jesus did this only by God's permission. However, this does not remove Jesus' divinity from the story because creating is God's unique attribute. It defines God. If God can share creating, then he's no longer unique. In Islamic theology, this is called Tawheed. And it's got to do with the oneness of God and how there is only one God who does all these things. 
And to have Jesus doing this, even by Allah's permission, is Allah sharing. Sharing the creative power. And sharing is the opposite of what they call Tawheed. So again, you need to, you need to think this through because if you haven't thought these types of doctrines through before, they may be new to you and you need to think them through in order to explain them. But the other thing that this shows, even if we just took Jesus as simply a man, even if we just said, okay, we'll take the Islamic view and Jesus is just a man, this actually shows that God's creative power, which comes from his nature, can be mediated through a, through a man. So if God can create the power from his nature through a man, then why have you got a problem with the incarnation? Because we're saying that God connects and expresses his person through a human body. You're already saying that God can connect with a human and express his creative power through a human body. You've already got the grounds for the incarnation there. Again, you need to practice this. And this is the last one because it's, it's, it's a little harder than the others. The others are more simple to use. But this one raises some big questions for Muslims if they believe in Tawheed and that there's only one creator. Well, to finish up, I'll give a summary now. Sometimes you may need to refer to the Quran. A Muslim may say to you, well, if you want me to read the Bible, why don't you read the Quran? And, you know, what are you going to do? You, you, you're most likely going to want to read it with them. Hopefully now you've got some ideas as to what you could read with them, what you could suggest to read together. So we saw, you know, before you do that, you want to be careful not to cause any younger Christians to stumble in their faith. And you want to be humble in the way that you, you know, you deal with the Quran. Don't claim to be an expert, but you can still look at, you can still look at it. And I suggested that you look at parallel passages, first of all, where we agree more or less, and you can show them something more important. That is that the Bible has the original story, the complete story, the, the Quran has some of the teaching, but really, if you want to understand the Quran, you need to go back to the Bible. My second point was there are some great parts of the Bible and the Quran that we can compare and contrast on Jesus and Muhammad, on paradise, and, and we can show them helpful contrasts to show how the religions are different. And then finally, there are some really useful verses, particularly when it comes to showing that the Bible is trustworthy and something that Muslims can actually read. And so I hope that if that opportunity comes up for you, you will now have some idea where to go. Amen.